Okay, well, first of all, may I just say a gigantic welcome to everybody for coming tonight. This room is awesomely filled. I'm just so delighted and honoured to have everyone here. You all look glorious, and I'm just so blessed and grateful for everyone to have come tonight. We've got people from all over Sydney, from locals, from the north, the south, east and west. We've got people from interstate with Rachel from Adelaide. We've got two people coming from Queensland, and we even have, where is she, someone who's come from the other side of the planet, from Toronto, Canada, we have Lynn, raise your hand, Lynn, <laughs> who has come here tonight, which is just such an honour. And I'm just, I can't tell you how uh, blessed and grateful I am to have everybody here tonight. Um, you will see this screen. This means, because I'm very forgetful, um, Layla and anyone who was helping Manish and Mina and Ian to fill drinks. So now is a good time for everyone to fill their glass, because I'm going to be talking for a little bit. <laughs> And if anybody would like to sit, please, please do sit. We've got a few chairs. All right, I'll keep going. Um, but yes, uh, can you fill drinks while just move around and, and <laughs> fill up your glass? Take drink orders or just, I don't know, carry multiple bottles simultaneously. Thank you. Thank you. Do feel free to move around. As long as the camera is on me at all times. <laughs> Now, this room has quite a number of people in it, and you will notice that everyone here comes from one of four groups in my life. Um, you will immediately recognize which group you are from. Mary and Steve, you are family. Um, but yes, we've got people from uh, my daughter's school, Double Bay Public School, my uh, colleagues from mental health, my piano buddies, and some family here tonight as well. Now, the um, interesting thing is, all of you here tonight are here as a result of one specific individual, myself included. Without this person, nobody would be here in this room tonight. And that person is my mum. My very beautiful mum, very glamorous. Um, I won't, yes, that's her after her third baby. Now, um, as for family, it's very obvious why you're here in relation to mum. I'm not going to labour the point, but we've got, where, where's... There's Auntie Susie, where's Aunt? There she is at the back there. That's yeah. mum in the middle. And my brother, and my, that's my sister. She's blonde and blue-eyed. We're nothing like each other. And uh, Jenny and my daughter, and there's Mary, and we didn't get one of Steve. And, and is Tash here? Not yet. Ah, oh, well. Um, but the others of you. Okay, so some of you may know that my mother was a psychologist, and she had a very big impact on my adolescence, telling me very captivating stories of her early career in psychology in the 60s, and telling me that there is no more fascinating profession than psychology. And as a result of that, uh, you know how it ended, I ended up becoming a cl clinical psychologist, and this is how I know all of people who work in mental health and their partners. Um, when I was 10 years old, I had an interest in playing the piano, and mum was terribly supportive in supporting this by paying for lessons all the way up to 22, taking me to piano lessons, picking me up, even making me a piano cake for my birthday, <laughs> which is, of course, how I know all the piano folk here tonight. Um, now, in the days before the secret and the term manifestation became popular, my mother was actually a very powerful manifester. The first instance of this was when I was 21 years old. I'd just broken up with a boy. And my mother said, well, what we need now for Julie is a man who is three words, big, kind, and strong. And one week later... I met this guy here, this is Ian, 25 years old. Now... Some years later, we went on to have Layla, oh and when she was old enough, she went to kindergarten at the local primary school at Double Bay Public, which is, of course, how I know all the Double Bay parents who are here tonight. So, if my mother was here, I would be saying, thank you, Mum, for not only giving me life, but essentially setting me up for the most marvellous foundation of life, I am going to have a little bit of a cry. <laughs> um, it's very hard to be a mother. And uh, I might just say, 
if we can raise our glasses to our mums, it's really hard to be a mum. <laughs> so if you're a mum, you're yeah. a mum. <laughs> to all our mums, to all of us who are mums, to all of us who have had a mum or have a mum, if we can have a toast to mums. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, moving on. Of course, I also have to say uh, an enormous thank you to Ian. If you can do the maths, next year I will have been with Ian for 30 years. Ian, you are my best friend, and I cannot imagine my life without you. And after all these years, you still make me laugh. We almost strangle each other most days, but we, we do laugh a lot. <laughs> I just want to take a moment to do to actually do mention a few things about Ian. Ian is the best. Um, he works incredibly hard, but he is an incredible father. I struggle to be a mother, but Ian has never, never, ever, not once raised his voice, expressed irritation or any anger to our daughter Layla. So it's quite remarkable. I've of course compensated, but moving on. <laughs> Ian is supportive to a fault. Um, our home has been wrecked by our uh, menagerie, our myriad of pets. Uh, our rescue cat, who has depression and is literally on chlamypramine, <laughs> who uh, urinates outside the litter box, and has, that's when she did it on the bean bag, and we tried to salvage it. The recent addition of pet rats, the pet lorikeet, and my multiple fish tank syndrome. He just <laughs> cleans the rat cage and cleans the cat wee, and does a lot of swearing, but you know, he's just awesome. Um, Ian also has the capacity to take on logistical nightmares with grace and ease. And the most notable um, recent experience of this was of course this gigantic piano you probably all saw when you came in. Now what I'd like to do at this point is actually break from tradition and do something that feels a bit risky on many, many levels. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, to quote the uh, brilliant psychiatrist and philosopher, Victoria Sundakov, who is standing over there, um, she says, I have the view at 50, one should do something which is very individual and true to you. And to this end, I would like to share with you a very personal story that I have titled A Tale of Struggle, Obsession and Joy. So before I start, anyone need to freshen their drinks because <laughs> It's actually going to be a long night. Okay, well, just uh, carry on. But um, Manish, get onto it. You know. <laughs> I'm, I'm so onto it. I, I will. I will. Richard, where are you? Uh, Drinks. Okay, everybody's comfortable. Everyone's got something to drink. Yeah. Okay, we continue. All right. So, tale of struggle, obsession, and, do and, uh, and joy. The story begins with struggle. It's June 2021, the world is in the midst of the COVID pandemic, Australia was in lockdown, uh, you couldn't get out of the country. Ian's businesses in Singapore and Malaysia were totally decimated by the pandemic and he was locked in, going mental out of his brain. He applied to the government to get out of the country, you could only leave for three months. He got a um, special application, he left, and we've never been separated for three months, it's the longest time. So I thought, what will I do? And I'd been thinking about returning to piano um, as an adult for a long time and I came across a YouTube commercial featuring an incredible Canadian concert pianist by the name of Carmen Morin. She looked like a movie star and she was advertising her new online piano course to help people improve their piano technique called Piano Foundation Formula. I didn't know whether it was a scam, I paid the $1,000 um, and it was absolutely, to be honest, quite life-changing. Two things happened as a result of this course, one good, one not so good. The good thing was I did actually learn to improve my technique, which took my playing skills to another level. The bad thing was that I learned that I, out of blue, suffered from pathological, catastrophic, mind-blowing clinical levels of performance anxiety. <laughs> and this was swiftly brought to my attention um, when I joined the first um, online masterclass which is basically um, held via Zoom amongst piano enthusiasts from all around the world, from Canada, the UK, Singapore, Australia, and some other countries, the US. Hosted by this fellow here, Charles Foreman, an extremely uh, intelligent and brilliant concert pianist. 
And uh, because I've done a lot of public speaking in my life, I didn't expect to be nervous. And when it was my turn to play, suddenly my hands are getting all wet. I'm doing what's happening. And when I put my hands to the keys, they start shaking. But not just a little minor treble. I'm talking about earthquake, volcanic shaking to the point I couldn't grip the keys. So I didn't just play like a, a nervous, you know, timid piece. It sounded like a preschool child just playing random notes. I was not expecting this. It was very discombobulated. I'm thinking, what is happening? And he's seen it before. He said, just keep playing wrong notes. Keep playing wrong notes. And I somehow struggled my way to the end. By the time the Zoom meeting finished, I switched off the camera. I burst into tears. And I thought, I will never, ever, ever put myself in that situation ever again. It was the first time I failed in my life. It was public. It was humiliating. It was extremely embarrassing. It was a, a total train wreck. Um, and for a couple of days, I was just gutted from the experience. It was just really awful. Um, and I know I've been chatting to some people. And this is not just unique to me. Can I just get anyone to raise a hand to see if anyone is a musician or a performer? Have a look around whether it is something it's not unique to me. It's a, a horrible problem. And it, it's very debilitating. Nevertheless, after a few days, a bit like after childbirth, you think, I oh, will never have another baby again. <laughs> I didn't. Some people do. I thought, you know what? I'm a psychologist. I don't do avoidance. I will go back and I'll do lots of practice and I'll challenge my thoughts and I'll do exposure and I'll show them how it's done. And I went back a month later and the same thing happened again. If the first performance was a one out of 10, the second one was like a one and a half out of 10, maybe a two at best. And I went back month after month and after about four months, I said to Charles, look, I have no intention of being a concert pianist. I, don't, I play for me. Why should I bother putting myself through this torture? It, it wrecked my day before, it wrecked the day during, even the day after. It was like almost a week out of my life that was just every month that was just awful. And very simply, with all his wisdom, he said, because it makes you a better pianist. And I didn't even know why or how, but I thought, well, I do want to be a better pianist. All right, but I realized that as a psychologist, monthly exposure is not sufficient to actually get over a, a significant anxiety. You're going to have to do it more often. Exposure therapy ideally should be done daily if you can, if that's not realistic for me. But I did take myself off to the public pianos to play in front of other people, uh, where Chris Ryan works at St. Vincent's Hospital. They have a piano there in the foyer. And I would go there, and if I was a cartoon, my heart would be pounding out of my chest, and you'd be seeing sweat emanating from my body. And um, I, I would start with the cover on and the soft pedal on and just very timid. And, over time, I got a bit braver, and then I even um, made my way up through my exposure hierarchy to the Queen Victoria building, playing the, the grand piano there. And over uh, probably too many times to remember, maybe close to two years, 18 months, two years, two things happened. Uh, Charles was right. I did become a better pianist. And perhaps more importantly, I have made very significant inroads to my performance anxiety. Didn't happen quickly, but it, it did sort of improve. So to this end, I would love to share with you a series of pieces tonight. It is a huge, it's a huge deal for me to be able to do this in front of all of you. And I'm going to get very upset again. You can't know your gift to me. Thank you so much for all the generous gifts. But essentially, almost the biggest gift is your presence tonight. It is just a big deal. So the first piece I will play is Claire de Lune. Most of you will know this piece. At least you'll know the beginning. When I started to play it, I only knew the famous bit. I didn't actually know the rest of it. Um, by the French um, composer Claude Debussy. Um, I'm not very good at interpreting music, but Ian is. He's very good at like three unit English and interpreting song lyrics and literature. And even though he's not a pianist, I asked him to listen to it. And I said, well, Ian, why is it called Claire de Lune? Because in French, it means moonlight. And he listened to it and he said, well, you could make the parallel that the moon has different phases. And this piece sort of represents different phases of life. And I'm not going to go through this because it makes me cry. <laughs> in saying it makes me cry. But it would be, as I said, a huge honour for me to play this for you now. So without further ado, I give to you Claire de Lune. <laughs>
I don't know if anyone read this. Yes. Anyway. Yes. Oh, you did? Oh, beautiful. Yes. <laughs> did, it, did it help? Oh. <laughs> okay, well, moving on. The next story is obsession, a tale of obsession. The story begins, Layla, where is Layla? At the piano, excellent. The story begins in 1989. I'm 15 years old, I'm taking piano lessons and my teacher, I'm a fairly mediocre um, intermediate student, and my teacher recommends that I start playing this very, pa very famous um, piece by Beethoven. It was called the second movement of a very famous sonata called the Sonata Path Pathetique. That's it in the middle. You can see there's a few notes, quite a few notes, but the one on the right, there's lots more notes. And that is the first movement. And um, I thought I did a pretty good job of the second movement. It's an intermediate piece and I played it in a way that I thought was pretty great for me. Um, but at 19, I had the whole sheet music all 20 something pages and I sat down at the piano living at home and I struggled to get my hands around this chord, but when I finally did play that first chord in orange, lots of notes, something, um, it, it's, even though I was only 19 and I didn't have any life experience, this chord really, it, was, it resonated. It was serious and solemn and had gravitas. Lalo, if you can give us that chord. That's the one. Very good, that was awesome. Yeah, it was just a, a very serious and solemn chord. And um, anyway, I, I couldn't play it. No, it was well above my skill set. 2006, we moved into this apartment and the very first item we bought was my former baby grand piano. And a few years later, I thought, you know, my, maybe I'll try and teach it to myself. And for about a year, I tried working my way through the 10 pages of it. And you see there's a horrible run at the bottom and the millions of notes. And I, it was totally hard. But after about a year, there were a few bars that I thought I could do quite well for me, but most of it was awful. Um, Fast forward to March 2022, I'd been um, doing Carmen Moran, the movie star Canadian concert pianist, her program and joined the next level, some of who are here this evening. Um, but I thought maybe I'd like to actually have individual lessons. And so they, um, I asked them to hook me up with one of their instructors and I met this phenomenal um, individual. She's formerly a mental health nurse, so we had an instant bond and connection, but she's just an extraordinary person. Her name is Jen Shakuda. She is a incredible pianist and a fabulous teacher. She's been more than a teacher, she's actually been like a mentor. And I said to her um, after a few months of lessons, I would really like to play that first movement of that Sonata Pathetique, but I'm very intimidated by it. And like a good psychologist, she said, well, Juliet, how about between now and the next lesson, you just learn the first line? And I thought, oh, well, that's not too bad. I definitely could do that. And for the next six months, I uh, eased myself into it and I really started practicing really hard and I thought I'd go back to those master classes which I'd stopped going to because I'd done enough exposure to teach my daughter don't avoid things um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I thought I'd make a comeback and um, I thought I'd come on strong with this first movement that I've been working on really long but it, bear in mind I was punching above my weight it was certainly well above my uh, skill level and when Charles Foreman said to me, so Juliet, what are you going to be playing? I said, well, Charles, I will be attempting to play the first movement of the Sonata Pathetique. And I played it. I had terrible performance nerves. I was very shaky. There were some trills that were totally gutted. But, you know, that long run at the end, I thought I did a pretty good job for me and it finished kind of strong. Um, and so I, he said, how did you feel about it? And I shared what I've just said. And then it was his turn to provide feedback. And for what felt like about 15 minutes, he went round pointing out all the ways that I wasn't good enough to play that piece and just kept going on and people in the room here tonight watched that, it was pretty awful to listen to, um, just like watching a, a lamb get slaughtered. <laughs> 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 to the point, and he kept going on, I said, Charles, I think we better move on to somebody else because, <laughs> because I might have to commit suicide. Just kidding. Um, but it actually was very demoralizing. But uh, what Charles didn't know is that that's just not any piece for me. This piece is an obsession for me. I've been working on it for like 30 something years and I was not about to give up. So essentially for the last two years or so, I've been working, not every day, but on and off on this piece. It's uh, three movements actually. The first, the second, and I even learnt the third one for the first time. And I would love to be able to play it for you tonight. Having said that, um, 
people's enjoyment of classical music is going to be contingent on their familiarity with it. And I thought I'd just take a, a bit of time to give you a little bit of background. Um, you can read these quotes here. It's actually been speculated that Beethoven suffered from <coughs> bipolar disorder. He certainly was documented to have very serious and significant episodes of depression, even becoming suicidal. <laughs> That's a moth. Um, yes, very suicidal, particularly around the time he started to lose his hearing. But he was also um, considered to possibly suffer from either manic or hypermanic episodes with periods of intense productivity working on multiple pieces at the same time, um, as well as um, experiencing episodes of violence and fits of rage and high levels of irritability, um, because in mania is many people here know, it's not just elevated mood where you're feeling euphoric and um, elated, it's also lots of irritability and Joe Garside, who sadly can't be here tonight, taught me if you're going to be punched by anybody in a psychiatric hospital, it's going to be someone with bipolar disorder. <laughs> so um, I just, I won't go through this extensively, but this um, is called the Sonata Pathetique. It was actually named by Beethoven himself. He didn't name all his pieces, but he did name this one. Originally titled the Grande Sonata Pathetique, which loosely translates to a big emotional sonata, which is kind of fitting for a room <laughs> overrepresented by people working in mental health. Um, for those of you who are not the musicians in the audience, a sonata is a bit like a play. It has a number of acts, but in music they call them movements. So there are these three movements. The first one is the longest, it's the most technically challenging. And to me it sounds, if you remember Layla's chord, it sounds like something catastrophic has happened. Like there's a death or a horrendous breakup or possibly, you know, learning that he's losing his hearing and he's going deaf. So it starts off with this very solemn, angry sort of beginning, but then it moves through a range of emotions, anxious, beauty, reflection, and a sonata will repeat halfway through the same themes, but there'll be a change. And you'll notice you'll hear those themes again, but now they feel different. There's bitterness and even more pain. And Beethoven has sometimes been referred to as the original heavy metal artist. There is a lot of very characteristic heavy Beethoven bangs here. So um, the second movement, however, is much slower. People might be familiar with this. It's a very famous one. It's much slower to me. It feels like grief following the violence of the first movement. There's episodes of sort of beautiful nostalgia and sort of depths of just depression going deeper and deeper. But then halfway through, there's a change in tone and it seems like things are getting brighter. And, you know, maybe there is a way to live and acceptance and hope for the future. The third movement is like he's swung into mania. It's manic, it's high energy, it's uh, electric, but it's playful, but it's also got that nasty, crunchy, sort of mani yucky mania, the irritability and anger in it as well. Now, um, this sonata, if, if you did your homework and looked at the invitation, did feature in the Pez Dispenser episode of Seinfeld. George's girlfriend, the pianist, played it in her recital when Jerry put a Pez Dispenser on her leg and Elaine lost it and started laughing. Um, but George did say something very relevant. He said to Jerry, don't clap when she stops playing. It's not over yet. And that is very true. <laughs> there are some fairly intense pauses. Now, um, it is very long, so what we're going to do is take an intermission now. Um, Ian and the girls are going to clear the table, somehow dump this food, or take it home, or whatever. Um, and in about half an hour, or when we're on, the videographers have to leave at a particular time, so we can't do it too late. But at around 8 o'clock-ish, um, we will continue with the, the second musical accompaniment of my obsession, the big emotional sonata, the sonata pathetique. Um, what I probably will do is when dinner is served, because it is quite long, um, it's about 15 minutes, um, I do want people to be eating, I want people to be <laughs> moving around if you want to be talking and so forth. Just do whatever you feel like. So I don't want people just standing bored. <laughs> just carry on. So um, uh, have another drink. Um, yeah. Yes, it's going to be a bit of a night and um, you'll hear it when it starts. Sounds good.
Don't tap me. Okay, guys. Um, I think it's going to be first.
intense for me. Okay, the last uh, final story is titled Joy. Um, just help yourself <laughs> and come and go and move around. Okay, so this story begins in March last year. It was a few months after the devastating feedback from Charles who said I wasn't good enough. And a few months later, I said to my wonderful teacher, Jen, um, look, I'm really trying to get back into that first movement. And for the musicians, uh, the non-musicians in the audience, the opening line starts with F and P. F stands for forte, which is loud, and it goes very swiftly into P, piano, which is soft. And you have to go loud and then quickly back off and go soft. And I could go loud and it would, the next one would come out loud. Or if I really held back, loud and then nothing. So I practiced for a week. And what, I can't do it. And I thought, maybe it's not me. Maybe it's actually the piano. And I said this to the, <laughs> I said it to the teacher. And she said, well, Juliet, have you ever played any other pianos? And I said, well, no, just my childhood piano and this baby grand that I'm playing on. She goes, well, they sound very different. You should go and play some other pianos. Go to the piano galleries. So with the bee in my bonnet, I, at the end of the lesson, jumped into the car, raced off to the Mecca of Pianos, which is the North Shore in Willoughby. And the second gallery I came to, I walked in and saw this familiar face that some of you may wear. <laughs> there he is over there. <laughs> Gary, the most delightful, non-aggressive salesperson you could ever possibly meet. <laughs> I explained to Gary what my problem was. My piano is just very loud. It lacks sensitivity and understood my concerns. And I said, I also live in an apartment and I bother everybody up and down. They all hear what I'm working on. I'm constantly anxious and tense that they can uh, hear me. And he said, well, he updated me on the technological advances in pianos. I play, but I don't know anything about music and I don't know anything about pianos. And he said, well, in the last 20 years, they've got these things called hybrid pianos, where it's an acoustic piano, like I have, with strings. But you can also play with headphones because it's got a digital component. I thought, brilliant for an apartment. So after playing all the pianos in the showroom, after about two hours, I was very um, almost ready to put a, uh, well, to purchase a very respectable Yamaha piano that you can't see it, but there's headphones there. But before I left, I said, hey, Gary, what are those um, fancy pianos in the back of the room there? These, I learned German, it's called these Bersendorfers. Um, he said, oh, they're the very high-end pianos. They're sort of like Steinways, but they're you know, better. Um, <laughs> and I said, well, to be assertive, because I'm actually very shy, would I be able to play one just for fun, just before I go? He goes, yeah, there's three. They range in size. He set me up on the largest one. And I played the second movement of that Beethoven that you just heard, and my fingers just sank into the keys like melting into the butter and the sound that came from that instrument just touched my soul and I played better than I'd ever played in my life and then I moved on to the first movement that the fast one and the angry one and there were these runs and I could do them and they were fast I'm like I feel like a legend this is amazing <laughs> but anyway for the price of a Ferrari we're not going to worry about it but um for two nights, I could not sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I was in love with this piano. I genuinely, it was like being totally infatuated with a crush. I could not stop thinking about it. I was driving to work. Tears would come to my eyes, remembering, this is sounds weird, how I played and just how soul-touching it felt. It was a very, very unusual experience for me. Um, Ian was overseas. I, <laughs> 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 I gave him about three minutes to come back into Sydney and say, you have to come to this showroom, you have to listen. 
And even him, it, without being musically educated, he's, he could sense that there was something special about that piano. But there was one small problem, and that problem was it wouldn't fit in our lift. So... <laughs> <laughs> So um, Ian, in all his calm wisdom, said, that's okay, we'll just get it craned in. <laughs> oh, what do I know about cranes? The problem was Gary attempted to contact the crane companies, Botany Crane, they're going, we're not touching it, it's an insurance nightmare. No. Other crane companies, they just wouldn't even reply to his emails. I took it upon myself to contact crane. But what do I know about cranes? This is my email, this is the replies. Basically, no problem getting it up, Juliet. We cannot get it through, there's not enough headroom. I don't know what that means, but apparently it was a problem. And I thought, I've just put a fairly substantial deposit on this piano. It's coming from Austria because it needs the headphones. Couldn't buy the floor model because it didn't have the headphones. Thought this could be a problem. Nevertheless, obviously the story ends well. <laughs> There is a hero to the story who comes from the unlikely combination of 90s rocker Lenny Kravitz and the Irish poet and author of Ulysses in the form of James Joyce. <laughs> he is a, a remarkable crane operator who replied to my message and said, yeah, I think we can do it. Ian Leo's with him, the coolest guy you could ever meet. Um, it took months, I ordered the piano in April it took forever to arrive. There were multiple delays, but delivery day was a Tuesday, the 30th of January. This is an actual photo. I woke up in the morning and there were very dark rain clouds. The weather app said there's a 50% chance of rain. And um, we're getting phone calls from the delivery company and Gary saying, we have to cancel the delivery. I've waited so long. I was like, the love of my life is arriving. I'm so excited. And they're saying you have to cancel. And um, James Joyce says, well, listen, mate, you've paid for my time and ground control. That's like five grand you're going to be out. The piano's going up. We're going to go to super cheap autos. We're going to wrap this bastard up into <laughs> plastic. <laughs> it's going ahead. So um, this also happened to occur on my daughter's first day of high school, which was a very exciting day for us. Um, and there was a parent's orientation that I wanted to be there, but I really wanted to be here as well. The timing was terrible. <laughs> I was torn. This is kind of the level of brain. It wasn't heavy, but I was using windscreen wipers on my way to school and going, what, what, what? Anyway, I got my mother onto it because she has connections speaking with the people above who organize things and Ian has his own special connections. By the time I got out of the parents' orientation, I get back to what, uh, the street. The ground control is everywhere. The crane does not do it justice. It was like this massive dinosaur. It was just huge. That's a man and it just doesn't... It, it, that's just to give you proportion. It was gigantic. Anyway, um, I won't show you the full video, but essentially, even though the rain had stopped, it had now picked up wind. And it was like 20, 27k winds, and they only deliver up to 25. So it went up, it was wobbling, it came down. Ian had a brainwave. We'll get, go to Bunnings and we'll get some rope and we'll tie it to the, and we'll hold it like a kite, like two ropes, <laughs> like a kite. And James was like, yeah, th I think that could work. Um, <laughs> why does Ian have to come up with this? Don't you, haven't you done this before? Anyway, they take forever to come. 40 minutes later, they're back. And this is a, you've seen this if you saw the, um, so such a cool guy, such a cool guy. Oh, wrong one. <laughs> Apparently everyone's there packing it and he is so calm. That's it, now move down again, mate. Move down. A little bit of still left. So, of course, you know how it ends. So, <laughs> it was uh, one of the most stressful days of my life, but also one of the most joyous days of my life. And so, to finish off, um, I would love to perform a very joyous piece by Chopin, 
Many of you will be familiar with this piece. It's the Gran Vols Brillante, a very brilliant and grand piece to pay on my very brilliant and grand piano. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you. 
thanks to the world to me to be able to do that.